as we'll have at 141. Danny Bertoni comes in for Maryland and just the beast, number four, Stevan Micic for Michigan. Stevan Micic is somebody that the wrestling world is really looking at right now, trying to figure out where does he fit into this 141 picture. He came in with a lot of expectation that he would factor into the title picture, but he's two and two on the year. He just suffered another upset loss to Jake Berglund of Minnesota. And as he adjusts to this new weight class, people are trying to, you know, is he rounding into form? Is he just taking some time to get, you know, his le legs under him as he works into the season here? He had a lot of time off working freestyle. This is a guy with a lot of skill. He was the one seed at the Olympics at 57 kilo. But like we talked about, man, two and two on the season. Good take down there. Got a leg, didn't get the points though. There was no control. Still on the back side for Bertoni. We just hanging on here. He's locked through the crotch, and that's really preventing the collection of both legs and both hips by Stevan Micic. This is an interesting scramble that Bertoni's able to extend, but now Micic is looking to turk this and use Bertoni's defense to stick him into a worse position than he otherwise might have ended up. They do get the takedown there for Micic. And he has the lead, he'll ride it out here to start. Micic is able to collect that takedown, but not without difficulty, not without having to extend the finish on it, right? Usually you would see him uh, uh, be such an efficient leg attacker and leg scorer. There he had to really work for that finish a little bit more. I think if you're Danny Bertoni, the more you can make him extend those scrambles into those folk style specific positions, the better it's gonna work for you, right? The better this match is gonna open up for you over time. Tony on both knees trying to fight to his feet. Able to get up top, trying to rip the hands off, and there's the escape for Bertoni. Gets aggressive again for the leg. Now Micic has the back. He takes him down, and there's a beautiful takedown from Micic. Bertoni tried to sit through to that crackdown again, and Micic saw it come in, had the feel, withdrew his shoulder, and was able to collect the second leg. And like we talked about, quick finishes. That was really smart wrestling for Micic made the adjustment on the second finish after getting in the same way and uh, ended up avoiding that long protracted scramble. So for Danny Bertoni, now you have to start to think, what's the next situation I gotta go to? You know, If the crackdown isn't working, what's gonna be next? Down to 30 seconds left here in the period. Micic has had control so far in this opening round. 4-1 score, can Bertoni get the escape late in the round here, trying to fight it off. Got a leg for Micic, and he takes him back down. Not a dramatic mat return, but one nonetheless as they go out near the scorer's table. No, it was really a diving, you know, I. it, it has to be said that Stevan Micic moving up a weight class, he is a little smaller than Bertoni. I would be a little bit surprised to see a lot of big lifts. So Micic is having to be a little bit more clever, dropping into the leg like he is there and use these claws. Big mat returns are not gonna be his friend. So Bertone, you're seeing him build a lot of base. You're seeing him able to tripod a little bit easier than you're seeing in some other weight classes. Now this will take us to the end of uh, the opening frame between these two. 4-1 Micic over Bertone. He's got a minute and 51 seconds of riding time to boot. Now we'll go ahead and defer here and Micic wants down position, and this could be a, a decent spot for Bertone, because as you mentioned, he's a little bit bigger than Micic, and we'll see how this ride goes throughout the second with Micic starting on the ground. Absolutely. If you're Bertone, you got to try to do some work here. You got to ride him like a coat of paint. You got to stay on top, make him wear you, but Micic too experienced, too clever. We talk about him as a freestyle specialist, and he is. Beautiful duck there. But this, this is a guy who grew up wrestling in, Indi in Indiana, grew up folk style, has done this his whole life. Beautiful escape there. And this is a guy, it's kind of tough for him late in the season to still only have four matches of experience. And you can notice that up and down Michigan's roster so far. They still have guys that are, even in January, that are still under 10 matches. So are they going to continue to work up that workload going into the postseason? Yeah, Michigan has had a protracted, you know, kind of a stop and start situation where they've had guys out for 
guys like Nick Suriano who are only starting the second half of the year. They've had guys like Logan Mass who have been out of the, you know, out of their lineup. They've had guys who have been in and out with COVID issues or with different injury issues. So they've been trying to work to get their entire lineup together at one time for this Team 100 that they have to make this push towards Detroit. But when you look up and down at when they do have this team assembled, it's a, it's a really incredible collection of talent, right? And you see the, the back points piling up there for Stevan Mitras as he gets that. But it has been an issue, right? You know, the, the coaches have got to be kicking themselves that this is the year for them to contend so heavily for that team title and even potentially for the team title. And now, we, you know, you're just seeing little cracks like that, right? Team currently sits at fourth in the dual meet rankings. They'll be third by the end of the week with Oklahoma State's loss this weekend. If they can win this dual meet that they already have a good edge in. It's 9-1 currently here at 141 as we saw those near fall points piling up for Micic. And that'll take us to the end of the second. Well, we're mentioning Oklahoma State. Get well, A.J. Ferrari. Danny Bertoni, one of only four Maryland natives in the lineup today. Uh, excited to see what he can make happen off the of bottom. This is a third period where he's going to need a lot of work if he's going to make something happen, right? He'll start on the bottom here. The Good riding time in. already guaranteed at this point for Micic as he's eyeing a major. Savan riding tough, but you can see Danny is continuing to be able to build a lot of base. He's not spending a lot of time bellied out. He's switching back in. He's staying very active, and he's able to get out. Danny Bertoni still competing through these positions, looking to be the first Maryland wrestler to be able to put points up on the board, right? 9-2 at this point, but still in major territory with the riding time. Minute 20 left to go here in the third. Stevan Mich is so, so good out of that two-on-one and so quick when you try to counter out of it at getting low onto that leg where he can sit you to that hip. Now Danny's trying to lock over the top giving a different scramble look than we were getting earlier. Stevan, higher head and higher hips, so he does have the advantage here, and he's going to look to turk that bottom leg as he collects another takedown. Ten-point advantage when you factor in riding time. One minute left. Nice trying to make a turn here. Could this be a late push for Michic? If you factor in these back points, now Dane Bertoni has to really start thinking about protecting the tech because this is going to be a 13-point advantage, 14 when you think about the riding time. 30 seconds left. Time for Dane to get real tough thinking about protecting this last point. And it looks like Misha is just going to let him he go trying to get it. this takedown here. He's got 25 seconds to try and secure a tech fall. But Bertoni, like you said, just trying to hang on at this point. 15 seconds for Michic. He'll attack again. He'll go for the leg sweep. Can't get it. Stevan having difficulty getting to that low level and creating that action in the last 30 seconds. Danny does a, does a good job of blocking off. Gives up the major. Stevan makes a great push late in the third period with that turn to make that tech a little bit more interesting. Was looking forward to him and Massa, but now we skip right to a ranked matchup here at 184 pounds. And Amin is the higher ranked wrestler, comes right out and looks to make a statement and collects both hips for a takedown quick. Olympic medalist, if I could mention, Miles Amin getting to that rear standing, looking to make a statement, looking to put himself in the lead, looking to a uh, 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 kind of big brother here early in the match. The older of the group of the two Amins, we already saw the younger one. And even with Conquering ranked at number 12, it's just such a tall order to go up against a guy like Miles Amin. He's got it at 2-1, but you mentioned even before the broadcast, it is kind of difficult for Conquering to work from behind. It's something that he's been trying to improve on. It's he's not more his of a guy that set. takes the lead and holds the lead. It's not his skill set, right? He's a little bit better countering. He's a little bit better in the scramble, he's better on top. I'm gonna be really interested to see him when he gets on top in this match. But him initiating his offense has been something that he's struggled in. Something I think is really interesting in this matchup is both these guys have spent significant time in their uh, careers down at 174, built up to 184. 
So I think there's something interesting there that they ha have in common. Uh, right now, Amin was quick on that first. They're saying we got some serious hand fighting to the face. Miles Amin getting warned for that, but I think that it was going both ways. Talk Miles Amin was quick to that first attack, but he hasn't been quick to a second attack, right? Was that to set a tone early, and is he gonna build on that? Something we're gonna have to see throughout. Cochran was the victim of an upset on Friday. He lost to Chris Weiler. He's the Southern Scuffle champ. He has a solid record against ranked fighters, but this uh, Miles I'm wondering Amin matchup he, is the... I'm wondering if he was overlooking Weiler a little bit. Not that you overlook anyone in the Big Ten, but was he looking ahead to Amin as an Olympic medalist? That is, that is a date that you circle in the calendar and you say, I want to be so on for this match, and I'm sure he's scouted and done work. And now here's one of these scrambles like we mentioned. Both these guys are so good low ankle, far ankle. It's a tough position here for both wrestlers. Uh, Cochran has that far ankle, looking to stay off his shoulders to not present a neutral danger count. He had the leg wrapped around the midsection of Amin, but Amin Crafty is able to get to the back. Very much so. He's really well schooled in that position and was able to sit through, collect both legs, get to his takedown. So Cochran has to go back to work from the ground up. He's got 30 seconds. He would do himself a big favor being able to score this period uh, uh, and cutting this lead in half leading into the second. I mean, I'm sure we'll be content to just try and ride this out the last 15 seconds at this point. Puts his riding time over a minute too. Big difference maker in this ranked matchup. They'll go a long way towards uh, establishing Miles Amin as the top dog that he has been in 184. Or it would be a very nice upset for Kyle Cochran. A lot of wrestling left. Four to one through the first period. And Maryland defers, Amin goes bottom. So this is that opportunity you talked about. We'll see how Cochran does uh, from the top position here against Amin. He's already, he's already showcased his craftiness a couple of times. We'll see what he has in store. He goes thigh pry and he goes with a claw. He's looking to pack up that far wrist and control there. He's now two on one, but he loses the wrist and Miles is able to explode up to his feet. Cochran was just trying to drive him out here. He's doing the best he possibly can. He was just barely able to do it. Before they escape, the two officials are going to discuss this. Did Amin get to that neutral position or not? It's going to be a matter of whether he slipped that shoulder. The referees say he wasn't able to slip the shoulder through and get to that chest-to-chest -chest position in time. So Cochran maintains control as he's able to keep that pressure enough to hold top position. Again, it was Pulls a good first move the there, hips. though, from Cochran to keep Amin from escaping. Pulls him back into the hips, but now he's got to be careful, similar to Michael North that he doesn't get reversed here. I mean, trying to wrestle the leg off of him and then eventually Cor Cochran had no choice but to just let it get back to neutral, give I mean the escape. He had to concede. Now here's where we're gonna see against an elite opponent like Miles Amin, is Kyle Cochran able to go ahead and start initiating his own offense? This has been something that he has shown a much better ability to do, but this would be the sternest test of that to this date this year. A minute to go here in the second. Amin with the edge. Amin with a little jab there. Now they'll engage again. Cochran for the leg. Amin up over the top. There it is, but he's not able to get two hands to the leg. He's not able to make enough of an attempt on it. Both these guys are kind of trying to work from the outside. Uh, they're both used to being a little bit quicker coming up from 74 to 84. And you see the quickness from Amin darting in on that low level. And now another low ankle scramble from Kyle Cochran. He was super successful with this at the Southern Scuffle against many ranked uh, opponents. Hunter Bolin, Lou Dupre among them. Let's see if he's able to make it happen here. He hips back in, knocks Amin down to a weaker position. Dang. Double dang, time ran out. I kind of wanted to see that play out. Yeah, that would have been interesting. We saw a one count there on backs for, against the Cochran. So Cochran's gonna go ahead and 
Choose the down position. He's down by four. He's giving Amin a good fight through two periods. Let's see who wins this first little battle here. Double thigh pry attack from Amin, and then this tripod stand-up that has become so common in college wrestling these days from Kyle Cochran as he starts trying to sit out and find some open space here on the side. Miles Amin dropping through to that far ankle. He's holding on I to feel like now. The count, the count should starting be going, here. Yeah. He's going here at 3 4. And then um, Matt return there from Amin. This is a really crafty little ride. You see when he hooks the ankle with his leg, that makes it really tough to do very much of anything for Kyle Cochran, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of that going around these days. Makes it difficult to build your base without getting bumped back down with a little knee in the hamstring there. Ref talking to Cocker, not quite sure what he's telling him. It looked like actually Cocker may have been given a warning there. Fleeing the mat, maybe? Could have been. This time Cocker is able to win the first move. He's able to get to his feet immediately on Amin. Can Amin recover? He can. He's able to get the leg down. The count starts here again. And Cochran, there's the and stall there's call. The stall warning uh, against uh, this time on Amin. So two times in a row, Amin has gone to this double thigh prize, his first move to try to break Cochran down. Let's see if Cochran makes an adjustment off that. He started to that time. Let's see if he makes a further adjustment there. Amin decided to take the stall call to further build up his riding time advantage. 5-1, minute 10 left in this ranked matchup. This time, there's a little bit of early movement. I feel like Cochran is trying to make the point that Amin is fighting the whistle too, but Big Ten, All-American caliber guys like this, you are fighting the whistle. You're going to fight the whistle. You're going to try to make that jump and be the first man to, uh, to it. So this will be a Not sure what longer we're conversation here. Not sure what we're discussing. Time to wrestle. It was difficult. Look, just oh, maybe like the, maybe there's an early a clock go. problem. like they were able to resolve that rather quickly. The music started playing. Did they ask them to turn the music on? <laughs> Again, Cochran tried to make a good first move there. This time he had the leg hooked underneath by Amin. Amin, Amin made the adjustment there. Amin went to a different breakdown. And Cochran was left to step back in the sequence there. But now this is a breakdown that Amin isn't quite as comfortable with. So the adjustment battle and sequence ended up favoring Kyle Cochran with the escape there. Minute and a half of riding time. That favors Amin at this point. That'll be locked here shortly. That's, that's almost going to be locked, right? That's going to get locked. So we're looking at 6-2. to two. Four-point deficit for Kyle Cochran is that does end up getting locked. So he's going to need plenty of scoring here in the last minute. But even one here, even just getting one takedown would matter so much for him. After an upset loss, after a rough weekend, can Kyle Cochran finish something here? But Miles Amin so crafty as he scrambles back through. Kyle Cochran with short time, scrambling back through himself. I love it. Trying to get back over the top. There are a couple of chances there. Amin hanging on as they get over the top. He's got both the legs of Cochran. He's trying to flip over the back to get the control on Amin. But unfortunately, there's not enough time for it this period for there to be any conclusion to that. In the end, it'll be a 6-2 win for Miles Amin. But a really good effort from Kyle Cochran to bounce back from Wilder. That was a fun match. At 197, we have a ranked matchup. It's number 32, Jaron Smith going up against number six, Patrick wow. Ruki, and Smith is going into the aggressiveness. How about that from Jaron Smith? Talk about an electrifying double leg, reminiscent of the one that he hit on Braxton Amos here on Friday. Jaron Smith goes ahead and launches Pat Brucky, who is six kinds of muscled up himself, to his back with a double leg. That is a lot of impressive technique and power from Jaron Smith on display there. Great skill. Jaron Smith, we've talked about the super vet here since the 15-16 season. He's had a lot of experience in his seventh year here in College Park. The final, the, the final of three Maryland wrestlers who will be uh, Maryland native uh, wrestlers who will be displayed here tonight. I always like to point that out. Maryland native myself, right? You want to see the boys out there. Uh, from Columbia, Maryland, 
putting together a tough ride on Pat Brucky. Throws in that left boot, is now looking to make something happen. Pat Brucky, All-American himself, transferred in from Princeton, now at Michigan. You know he's a smart kid if that's the case. Now looking to make something. He's, he's starting to play with the, the foot under there, so we may be looking at a scramble and potentially a reversal from a leg attack here. We did see Jaron reversed by Braxton Amos on Friday. So let's look to see what happens here. But the problem for Pat is, as he plays around in this, you see the riding time clock is going up and up. So let's see how the situation unfolds from there. jaron has been getting his legs back. He had missed a couple of duels, had some COVID issues, but he's back and he's looking good here so far against Pat. He should get Pat his leg Brogge. back right now if he's getting his legs back. Speaking of getting his leg back, but he could look cradle. He could look cradle. And there's a nice reversal and from Brucky the reversal. inside up at two. He's staying on the legs. I think the Maryland corner is not happy that he's not building up into the body, and there it is. And there's another cross face. Look, there's a challenge thrown by Alex Clemson in his corner. He's challenging to say that Pat didn't do enough of a job building up, and it should have been a stall call after the reversal. Jaron in a ton of pressure and danger here of giving up that bottom leg turk. He's having to really fight to clear his leg. And here comes the shoulder down nearly oh, from Brucky. Man. Couldn't get the power down to he put that battles. one away. He had to make a strategic decision there to go to his back to go to his belly. Big energy expenditure. So if nothing else, and this isn't why he threw it, but if nothing else, the challenge is going to give Jaron a second to breathe because that was a lot of energy to have to fight out of that situation. Well, you said he came back from COVID issues. Th it, that situation was not kind of somebody coming back from COVID issues, trying to get his sea legs back underneath of him. So they'll take a look at this. Actually, for, for what it's worth, Jared not breathing that hard. I mean, that was a battle, and uh, probably lucky it happened when it did. That's something in the third that can Ooh, put buddy. someone away through two and a half minutes. Yeah, just enough, it still had enough gas to just battle through that really good position for Jaron Smith. And uh, or maybe he's asking for a locked hands call, but that wouldn't be the case because it's a potential pinning combination. So I think it's the stall. I apologize if I'm incorrect and I'm just missing something and being silly. Could be either way, but it, it, Alex Clemens was really animated. He's pretty that animated reversal. about it. I'm going to ask him after uh, just to make sure. Taking a long look at this, so clearly there is something to this challenge. It's tied at two currently. We'll take a look at what we think it may have been. Let's After take this a look reversal. at the sequence anyway, yeah. I think he was looking cradle, but Brucky did a good job keeping his knee back. There's the reversal, and he's real low on the hips here, not working up. And this is, and you see some of the guys saying one, two, and you see him counting in the corner, which makes me think, that they're looking for the count for the stall call, right? But you can't go back and add the, the stall. You can't go back and add the count later because it's something that Brucky would need to hear to move up. So ultimately, I'm not sure that this is going to get overturned in any way. Certainly, the reversal is not going to get overturned. This is going to be 2-2 two to two with Jaron Smith on bottom. I, I, I didn't see anything there that would... Uh, uh, make that different. So a long look uh, taken at that sequence. Smith had the start. He had the first takedown, then he was reversed. He's been prone to that in the last couple of appearances for him. Well, Jaron likes to get in a lot of exchanges, right? Jaron is not afraid to mix it up on the mat. He's a guy who has shown a lot of pinning ability himself, especially with that cradle like he was looking for you. That's why you saw Brucky do a great job keeping his leg back. He had to know that was coming. And that that willingness to mix it up on the mat is going to lead to a little bit more likeliness to get reversed in some of those positions as well uh, when you compare it to some guys who played a little bit more conservative there. Since the break, it's been a major for Michigan, a forfeit victory and then another decision, both the – the way they're the looking at this makes me feel like I'm wrong and they're looking at something a little bit more serious. It may very well be. Michigan 
still waiting for the call. As is Maryland, some of the Michigan fans clapping over there. Not sure if they heard something we did not. They're going back and giving a stall call, which they're not allowed, they can't do because you have to give Brucky a chance to work up by telling him he's low on the leg and giving the one, two, three, four, five call. So that's not how it's supposed to happen. Now is Clemson still upset? No, I, Alex is just telling the other corner, like, you know, don't get mad at me for losing, for winning the challenge. Uh, uh, you know, I won the challenge, what do you want? So it's 2-2 two, two either way. Still a lot of action here, and it turns out that just ends up with Brocky having a stall call. Brocky has a stall call. So two more, and then we'll What's probably happening it is I'm probably wrong on the rule book, but I'm going to go back and check that later. Jaron trying to get to his feet. He has over a minute of riding time, but that clock is not going the right way for Smith. That is the issue, but he keeps it over a minute which is a great little battle. Matches come down to a lot of little battles, and that was a great little battle for Jaron. And Jaren there's gets a aggressive again, but Brucky, he's gonna take it away, trying to bring him down with the leg. Jaron's gotta recover off the back side. And they want the call from the Michigan bench, and they'll get that for the two for Brucky late here in the first. And there's another challenge thrown here by Alex Clemson. They wanted the, the uh, I think they want the same the thing. The same I think exact they want thing. the same thing. I think they want that stall call. And if they're able to get that, if they're able to win that, that's going to be a point. And that could be big considering it is 4-3 currently in favor of Brucky after that takedown. And so we'll get another long look here possibly at a stall. Brucky was able to respond well there to Jaron Smith's early takedown with a reversal and then a takedown of his own. If we could see the replay, we'll be able to get a better uh, idea exactly of what he was challenging. Here we go. From there, they're saying he stayed a little too low, but leg on leg, I think that's gonna be a tough call to be able to get. So we'll go over and look we'll at this see. one again. I mean. We weren't sure about the first one and ended up hey. resulting in a stall warning. So if this Shut me up does once already. turn out to be a stall, it will be 4-4. Four, four. Otherwise, it's 4-3 in favor of Brucky. Good first period, a lot of action. 197s exchanging takedowns here early in the first. 197, one of the most interesting weight classes to me here in the NCAA this year, this season. Alex Clemson will not win this second one, though. Pat Brucky starts on bottom. He's going to have a chance to extend his lead by scoring here. But Jaron Smith is good on top. Gets that leg in and Brucky rides really well. Fights loose for a moment. Smith hanging on by that leg. They're not going to get back it yet. Now it's nearly a pull out here to the near side. But they're out of the circle. A good scramble there, but they said no. Nothing was established there at all, so it will remain Jaron on top. No, no it will make a late change, the and they will get the escape for Brucky. It's at least going to – are they giving the escape, or are they giving a locked hands? Must have, it looked like it must well, have been locked lost hands. The brick. Yeah. So they're saying on the chest wrap attempt, it was a locked hands, and so Brucky goes back underneath, but Jaron gets another chance on top and breaks him down really well with that single hook. So it's 5-3 after the locked hands call. Man, you got to wonder if Jaron would almost take that because now he gets a chance to work for more riding time. He gets a chance to maybe ride out the period. He gets a chance to maybe even potentially work for some big scoring pinning combinations here, or near fall combinations, rather. Smith has a, at a minute 25 of riding time. Still has a minute and 15 seconds left here in this period. He's really been able after that uh, locked hands call without the escape on the edge he's been able to turn this into a much better ride by uh, getting that left boot in but now Pat Brucky has been trying to get that same reversal going not able to get that going at all right Jaron's been able to make the adjustment he wasn't able to make in the first period to put together a much tougher ride in the second 
and there it is. There's the foot coming through, looking to sit Jaren into a hip and start to pull it up to reverse him through. Happened earlier in the first. We'll see if Jaron responds differently here in the second period. He has 30 seconds left, and he has done very well with the riding time. Now it's over two minutes. For Brucky, he has the left leg of Smith up against his chest, but it'll be a stalemate. Jaron did a great job there of staying locked in, drawing the stalemate, making Pat carry his weight, and you putting together a lot of riding time, 221 over a much higher ranked opponent, a top six opponent. Jaron Smith has rode very well throughout this period. Like I said, tough, tough top rider. And you can see Alex Clemson on the sideline motioning during that, keep him down, keep him down. Here for the end of the period though, but he's just hanging on for dear life. This could be a reversal situation. Huge. And they get it, that is a game changer for Brucky. Those are late period points, and that is what makes a huge difference so often at this elite level, right? End of period scoring. Because now Jaron doesn't have an opportunity to wrestle back, score back with a reversal, with an escape. Big, big points. Because he was at the point where if he would have been able to escape to start the third, he would have had that plus the riding time. Would have given him effectively a tie. Now instead he finds himself behind by four. Let's not take him out of the match, though. An escape here plus that riding time is huge. He's only a takedown away from really uh, effectively almost tying this match. An escape and a takedown, rather, assuming he can get these. Darren on a knee currently. Now he's in the splits. And Brucky was able to power through. And they're going to get a warning. There's a warning there. That's going to be a stall call. That's a point for Smith. And now Michigan will challenge. Yeah, now Michigan's going to challenge. And they're Jared, all over the official. I, I feel like Jaron almost baited that position and drew it. And now Jaron is going to get a chance to. Jaron's going to get a chance to breathe, which I feel like he needed. Now the two corners are exchanging some words. Not rare in Division One wrestling for these uh, coaches to be more than a little bit competitive. Clemson and, and Sean Borman are having a conversation here. They'll both call their wrestlers over to the corner as they look at this. But it's been a good battle here. The unfortunate part about it is it's been kind of stop-start, which kind of makes it difficult to settle in. We've had three reviews in this seven-minute match alone. As we'll take a look at what was called. So they're saying because Pat is riding with his hands on the legs there for a five count without working up and, and without setting up a pinning combination, that that is his second stall call. That's going to be a point for Jaron Smith. Now with the riding time factored in, now we're looking at a seven to five match with an escape that's seven six. We're really talking about a, a potential upset here. Especially Although Jaron's going to have to get something going from the feet for that to really matter. or. Let's see, you know, what could happen on the field. There's a lot of ways to win this match, but that one point that's going to be upheld, really, really uh, uh, impactful here going into the third. And I also has to change the way that Brucky approaches this because he cannot afford another stall. You, you see it. He, he's cutting him. He's going to go optional start, which I think is the right move. He can't afford to really get into these battles, and he's had the majority of his success standing. So now a takedown would effectively put Jaron Smith in the lead, but... That kind of airplane double is going to make life tough. And you see on the re-attack, Pat Brucky living good. He's got Jaron in a really tough spot, and there is the two. Man, Jaron feeling good, but shot from far away and gave up a strong re-attack to Pat Brucky, who has really, really uh, been scoring well off of his feet there. So it's to 9-5. Standing to the point very close to the riding time being locked for Smith. Brucky was cut him loose. To do with just, the mat he does not want to be on the ground at this point. He'll just cut Jaron loose. So it's 9 6. But Jaron's still in position where a takedown ties us up essentially. Takedown, he would need to put together a heck of a ride, but you're absolutely right. And now he knows there's two an ankle. Can yeah, he suck can he this in and through? build this in? Pat Brucky trying to feed a lot of hips here. As Jared tries to get his head up and his hips in, Pat Brucky doing all the right things. Jared Smith really bent out of position here, and he's able to clear. 
Still has a chance to make a move, though, for Smith. His, his riding time point is locked. He just needs a two in order to tie this thing up with 30 seconds to go, but he's in a bad spot underneath Brucky. Pat Brucky not reattacking the same way. Late in the match, it's Jaron Smith giving himself the opportunity, sitting around. Can he around. spin the hip over the top? He can. The question on Brucky. No control in, he's got to get over the top in 13 seconds. He and sits around, that's get it two. Back. There that's it two. is, there's the two. With seven seconds to go, he's got the riding time. That's gonna tie this thing up We're nine. going to overtime. Number six, number 32. Is there an upset happening? A lot of life here at the Pavilion. We're tied at nine and 197, and we'll have a sudden Jared Smith has the momentum here. And how about that late scramble there? The Terrapin the has the momentum in the upset. Let's see it. So we are ready to roll here from the neutral spot. Jared Smith suffered on the reshot earlier. Can he get a good setup like he did when he scored? Smith, there's gonna be this feeling out process. Smith went in, Brucky over the top. Still nothing to go yet. Brucky powers forward. Smith still over the top. Can't get over. He throws he gets to the ankle. Again, trying to fight over the top. Can Smith get there? He wants him to. He needs to clear the arm. He He's got to clear it. He hooks the leg out of two. Exciting one. We have to bring ourselves back down to earth here for the heavyweight battle between Mason Paris and Zachary Schrader. Speaking of coming back down to earth, that snap down for Mason Paris will do it to just about anybody. Mason Paris, one of the biggest, strongest NCAA athletes, well, NCAA wrestlers certainly that I've ever seen. Mason Paris gets the takedown there. Kind of a difference between what we saw on Friday when Trent Hilger battled Schrader. It's definitely Mason Paris, a different type of wrestler at heavyweight. He's Not enormous. Quite as fast, but a, just an enormous human being as he's just letting Schrader go at this point. He's got two takedowns. Schrader with two escapes. It's four to two. He's got muscles in places I don't even have places. This isn't fair. And again, just Paris right on the back to make an a 6 2 advantage. Yeah, Mason is uh, uh, one of the best wrestlers, not just in the NCAA, but in the world. Uh, he is a junior freestyle world champion. He's a multiple time NCAA All-American. And he has long been a really exciting heavyweight who shoots a lot, who scores a lot, who can wrestle a little bit upper body, but we're gonna see him try to put together a ton of low level attacks here. Paris just fighting off of Schrader. He went with an attack there. Schrader couldn't get back over the top. 6-3 currently. Paris almost working Schrader out here. He's trying to get over the back. Before they get out of the circle, they wanted the takedown. Not going to get the call. And if they're out, we'll come back to the center. One minute and 15 seconds left here in the first. Mason Paris coming off of a tough loss to Gable Dan Stevenson of Minnesota where he gave up a major decision. So he's looking to come back, put himself back on the winning track and, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep his winning ways going. Over the last few years, he's only lost to Gable Stevenson and recently uh, suffered another loss to Greg Kirkley at, of uh, Penn State. But he has charted himself as not just one of the most successful in terms of wins and losses, but as one of the most dominant as well. 
uh, picking up majors, tax pins at an incredible clip. He's working if, on a turn here against Schrader. If it wasn't for Gable Stevenson, we would talk about Mason Paris in, in many of those same terms, right? As a dominant, exciting, uh, uh, next level heavyweight, modern heavyweight. He's got Schrader on the ropes here. He's already got four points on the back there. And this is not to downplay Schrader, who has been fantastic for the Terps this year. Zach Schrader, I, I believe we're going to see him in Detroit wrestling at the national tournament. It's just that I happen to think we're going to see Mason Paris wrestling Saturday night in Detroit. At the uh, Zach Schrader has been able to produce huge results for the Terps, winning us several dual meets, uh, but just having difficulty with the very unique skill set that Mason Par Paris brings. Wrestling acumen, size, speed, strength. Uh, if you ask me to build a, a game plan against a Mason Paris, you better be Dan, you better be Gable Stevenson. You know what I mean? At this point, 13 to three. Paris with a quick escape there to start, and then he'll get the takedown here and give himself a 15 to three buffer. He's eyeing a tech fall here. He's going to try to work the turn here on Schrader. But as you mentioned, though, Schrader's been big for Maryland. He helped them to wins at Duke, at, at, at or home against Duke and Drexel. All three of those, he was uh, instrumental. Drexel, Duke, Navy. Navy and Drexel in particular when he had the victories to give them the win. Yeah, don't downplay that Navy win. That was huge. And he's been big since coming in to the program, transferring from Cal Baptist. Absolutely huge, just not as huge as Mason Paris, who is going to cut and look for a couple more takedowns. Zach Schrader going to look to make something happen here in this period, try to get some of the reattacks working on his own. But again, just difficult to deal with somebody who has such a unique skill set because how do you get somebody who can even mimic that for you? This is like the one time you're going to even see somebody who is able to do these things. I mean, he takes down Schrader again. I mean, you said I mean, he's like going up against a bear. I don't know when what to do. When you look at Mason Paris, and, and he finds himself. It's like watching the movie The Long. Revenant. Almost. <laughs> at this point, when you're looking across at Mason Paris. He's trying to get the near fall county, make it the he fall the, together. He, has he already the near has fall, before, so and that will be the match. Away. This match is over regardless of if Schrader fights his way out or not. And he another does. Maryland wrestler who fights up through the end. It is a noting. tech fall in the end though for Mason Paris 21 to 4 is the score there and the final for the dual meet will be 40 to 3